Well, we have been in the series, Stuff Happens. Stuff Happens, and it certainly does. We know stuff happens. Uh, suffering was the first message we talked about in this topic. Suffering happens. It just does. We can think that we're never going to have to suffer in this life, but the truth is you're not going to check out without going through some circumstance that's difficult. It happens. It just is the way it is. Then we talked about unanswered prayer happens. And uh, we don't like to think about that. I'd much rather watch the television preacher who says, if you pray it and believe it and send $25 into their ministry, it's going to be done. I I'd love if that was the way it is. But my experience has been it doesn't always work that way. Unanswered prayer happens. Then last week, Ethan teed it up, knocked it out of the ballpark with um, a sense of insecurity happens. Was that what it was, insecurity? Insignificance it meant a lot to me. It, meant, it was memorable and it meant a whole bunch to me. Insignificance happens. That sense of um, I feel bad about myself and I just can't help it. I'm insignificant. I don't really matter. And God wants to help us understand. But it happens. All of us feel that. Today, we're going to talk about a very positive message. Sin happens. Now, I'm just like y'all. I squinch up when I think, that, when I think you're going to talk about what? You're going to spend 30 minutes talking about sin. Yeah, that just doesn't sound like a topic that I really am jazzed about. But it can be for us a real life-changing experience if we understand when sin is discovered in our lives, there is something wonderful that can happen that will allow us to deal with it. Sin happens, it does. It's a part of our wiring, but we don't have to live that way the rest of our lives. Let me start with a scripture in Philippians chapter 2. This will be just kind of a place to launch from. Philippians chapter 2, the apostle Paul says this, therefore my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act accordingly to his good purpose, according to his good purpose. Two phrases I want you to kind of hang your hat on just for a moment. The first is this, continue to work out your salvation. And then the next phrase, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Here's the idea. This is not work out like go figure it out, however you can figure it out, just go figure it out. It's no, God is working in you, so then you can work it out of you. You can, it's on the inside, you can now work it out. That's the idea. This is Paul saying, in this Christian life, there's some things you're going to need to do. This is because of grace. Because of God's grace, we're going to work out these things that he's placed in us. We're going to work it out. It's not sit in your easy chair with your feet up the rest of your life. That's not it. It's because of his grace, his free gift to us, we will work out what he has placed in us. Now, I hope nobody here has to uh, question whether they ever have sinful thoughts or actions or attitudes that creep into their life. I think most of us know that all of us experience times like that. Here's a little story that I wrote just because I thought maybe it would identify with, with someone here. Calvin has struggled with temper his entire life. That's been his struggle. He gets mad and he hurts people. Sometimes he hurts them with words. Sometimes he hurts them with his hands. It seems as natural to him to explode in rage as it is to breathe. And the crazy thing, Calvin is a Christian. He asked Jesus to be the leader of his life. He knows what the Bible says about being a quick-tempered man. He knows the damage he has done to his children, the damage he's done to his wife because he has acted out of his simmering rage. He feels horrible about it. He knows he has blown up good relationships with his quick fuse. You could even say that he's grieved over his sin. He knows that Jesus said it was equal to murder when you hate. And he has known the hot flash of hate again and again and again early on in his christian life he thought he would change there's going to come a day when he's going to be free from the sin but 20 years later he's not free 
20 years later, it seems like it's worse. It seems the longer he has persevered in this habit, the more ingrained it has become as a part of his character and the harder it is to get it out. He prays, deliver me from this sin. Why don't you take this away? Why do you make it so hard? But nothing changes. And what's so aggravating to Calvin is he knows people who the minute they gave their life to Jesus, it's as if their sin was evaporated. Problems that they had just instantly went away. People who had bad habits like gossip or, or addiction or, 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 or gluttony, the people who struggle with things, their desire for that was instantly gone. They were delivered miraculously. So he's left wondering, why not me? Why do I struggle all my life with this thing when people get zapped out of it magically? It's not fair. It's not fair. I don't know if you can relate to Calvin. I have thought those things before. Why am I struggling with this same thing over and over and over when I have known people and it seemed to be miraculously taken away? And I want you to understand something. My observation as a pastor for 30 plus years is it is rare when it is just instantly removed. It happens. Sometimes it does happen. But for many of us, there is a process that is involved for us to work out what he has worked in. You understand what he has placed in us. For us to work it out, there is a little bit of a process. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to really just talk about two questions. It's kind of, I think, helpful. Why is it sometimes so hard to get rid of sinful behavior? If sin happens, why is it so hard to get rid of that behavior? And number two, how can I cooperate with God's change process? Now, I don't know what your big deal is. I don't know if it's anger like Calvin. I don't know if it's something that maybe I've struggled with. Or it may be something totally off the map I've never even thought about. But you know there's something, there's something deep down on the inside that's just not, it's, it, it's hindering you. It's preventing you from being all that you feel like God wants you to be. Maybe it's even hurting people. It's hurting you and it's hurting other people. I want you to be active with me. I want you to really think with me. We're, we'll take 20, 25 more minutes. That's it. But I want you to really stay with me and I want you to answer these questions in your mind and I want you to leave today with an idea of what's that next sin that you want to address in your life and ask God to help you overcome it. Because I think it's sad when in churches, people can be followers of Jesus and get so comfortable in their sinfulness that they just live repeating the same patterns for decades. It's not supposed to be that way. We are supposed to be becoming more like Jesus. It's a process, but we are supposed to be becoming more like Jesus. And when you just decide, man, this is just who I am and deal with it, that's, that's a hard heart. You don't want to have that hard heart. All right, pen in hand, we're going to move quickly through the first part. Why is it so hard to get rid of my character defects or my sin? Number one, I've lived with it so long. It's been my whole life. If you've had something as a pattern for your whole life, it's not easy for it just to go away. We didn't get them overnight. It took years for us to develop them. We're not going to lose them overnight unless God chooses for you to be that person that has a miraculous encounter where it just goes. For most of us, it's a little different than that. Many of the habits or the character hiccups or the sinful behaviors that we have, we develop them in childhood. And they maybe have become even comfortable for us. We may recognize they're self-defeating, but at least they're familiar like that comfortable pair of shoes that your spouse says, please don't wear those shoes. Those are horrible shoes. Those are ugly shoes. Don't wear those shoes. I've heard Denise say that to Rick. Don't wear those shoes. Why are you wearing those shoes? They're comfortable shoes. Yeah, but you're going out with me. Don't do that to me. They're comfortable. That's what we do. We just are a little bit comfortable in, even though we know it's self-defeating, we know it trips us up, we're comfortable in our sinfulness because we have carried it around with us our whole life. That's one issue. Number two, another issue that we need to think about, about why is it so hard for us to get rid of these behaviors is because I identify so well with them. I identify so well with them. I don't know why, but we often confuse our identity with our defects. 
I can look back on large periods of my life where if you said, Ray, tell me about yourself, I would say, well, I'm, I'm Ray, and I'm not, not really very disciplined, and, and I'm Ray, and, and I, uh, I struggle with this, I struggle with that, I struggle. My identity was to a large degree hinged on my defects rather than on being a child of God that he was developing wonderful things in as far as character and, and life and teaching me. And I, I, I saw myself always on the other side of that. I want you to do something for me. Maybe you can write this down on your outline if, if you don't mind, or if not, at least play with me and do this in your mind. Complete this sentence. It's just like me to be blank. It's just like me to be blank. What comes to mind? It's just like me to be a workaholic. It's just like me to be overweight. It's just like me to be anxious all the time. It's just like me to worry. It's just like me. It's just like me to be passive and let people just run over me. It's just like me to be fearful. It's just like me to lose my temper. It's just like me. It's just like me. It's just like me. Hang on to that. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. What we do sometimes is we set ourselves up by identifying ourselves with our weaknesses, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You say, I'm just always nervous when I get on an airplane. What's going to happen the next time you get on an airplane? You're going to be nervous. You've set yourself up. This is who I am. What happens is we unconsciously do this, and it's one of the reasons we can't change is because we're almost afraid to change. We have kind of created this image of ourselves, and we are afraid to be anything but the image that we have created for ourselves. I don't know why it is. I'm going to get on this diet one more time. You're going to see another month, whoo, over the edge. I'm going to, why do we do that? Number three, third thing I want to ask is this. Why is it so hard for me to deal with my character defects? Because they provide for me a payoff. Of some sort, they provide for me a payoff. Every defect, every sin, everything that we struggle with has some payoff for us. For example, it may mask my pain. Some people who struggle with addictions, it is a way to cover some hurt that they have. Same thing with people that overeat. It's the same exact thing as people who overeat. Sometimes it is we feel an emptiness and so we go to the cupboard because it feels that, feels that empty, emptiness for us. Sometimes it allows us to compensate for guilt. Sometimes it gets us attention. Sometimes it gets us attention. And we feel like bad attention is better than no attention at all. Sometimes my defect allows me to control people. I have known people who had temper problems and their bigger issue was they exercised their temper because they liked to be able to control the situation and they kept everybody on eggshells because you never knew when they were going to rage. Because you never knew when they were going to rage. They just kept everybody. They were able to control everybody. Anytime a negative behavior is repeated in you, yourself, your kids, anybody, even though it's self-destructive, it seems to me there's always a payoff. Number four. Why is it so hard for me to get rid of the character defects in my life? Because Satan so easily discourages me. Now, I know he's a liar, but there have been decades that he has easily discouraged me. The Bible says he is the accuser, and we know that's true. He is the one who is constantly suggesting negative thoughts into our mind. He's the one who says that'll never work. You can't do that. You're not going to change. You come from a long line of people who couldn't change. You're certainly not going to change. He always says negative things. He says, if you try to change and this is not going to work, you're going to end up being more crazy than you are right now. Why are you even going to bother with it? That's what he does. But the Bible says he's a liar. And the Bible says the truth shall set us free. But it's one of the things that holds us back. All right, that was the first question. Why do I struggle so much with these things? Here's the second question. How do, can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up? How can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up? This is where you're going to have to be active. You've got to think. I don't want you thinking about what, I wonder what Ray's sins are. Let's guess what his are. 
I want you to be thinking about what yours are, okay? Mine are really nothing. Not really. But anyway, I mean, we all have sins, right? I want you to think about what yours are. Romans 12, 2 is a key verse for this whole section. Romans 12, 2 says this. Don't conform to the patterns of this world or the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your thoughts, big principle, your thoughts, what you believe in your brain is your autopilot for your life. If you want to change your life, you've got to change the way you think. The Bible says it like this, your thoughts determine your feelings, and your feelings often determine your actions. We've got to change the way we think. Now, here's the big picture for today, all right? If you are in a boat and it has autopilot set this way, and you're in this boat and you're saying, okay, I don't want to go this way anymore, but the autopilot's set this way, you can turn that boat and you can say, this is great. I'm going this way. We're doing good. But what you find is if the autopilot is not off, it is really painful to pull against the autopilot. And eventually you say, okay, that's no fun. We're just going to go back this way, all right? That is exactly what happens in our hearts, in our lives. We have an autopilot that says, I'm always going to be the guy that messes up. I'm always going to be the guy that makes the mistake. I'm always the guy that's a relationship ruiner. I'm always this guy, this guy, this guy. I don't want to be this anymore. I'm going to have New Year's resolutions. I'm going to do better. I'm going to stick to my diet. I'm going to do all these great things. It's going to be true. Just watch me. Watch my smoke. I'm going to do so good. Golly, I'm so tired. I can't do this. I'm just going to go back and do exactly what I've always done. That's exactly how it works. So the Bible says we have to transform our mind if we're ever going to see anything really significant happen. It's not about a resolution. It's not about willpower. It's about totally having a change of what your autopilot is. Now you say, well, I don't know if I understand this. Remember when I asked you to fill in the blank? It's just like me to be blank. It's just like me to be workaholic it's just like me to be a killer of relationships it's just like me to get off the diet it's just like me to be anxious it's just like me to be passive and let people run over me it's just like me whatever you filled in that blank with that is your autopilot you get it that's the autopilot that autopilot has to be changed before you are going to ever see victory it will not happen unless you change the autopilot. So I'm going to give you seven quick, seven quick thoughts on what needs to happen for this to take place. Write it down. Number one, how can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up? I need to focus on changing one thing at a time. Focus on changing one thing at a time. If you say, golly, I love this message. I got 32 things I want to change about my life today. 32 things and I'm going to have it fixed. You're not going to do good. You're not going to do good. It's not going to work that way. What you've got to do is say, God, what is the, is there, what's big? I, I mean, I know they're all big, but what's, what's the first one I can, I can get my arms around? And then begin to think about that one. Begin to think about that. Be specific. God, this is what I want to work on, my anger. Or God, this is what I want to work on, my anxiety. This is what I want to work on. I know I'm a controller of people. Or this is what I want to work on, my gossip I'm a gossip and by the way let's never think that those are little sins and the other sins are big sins gossip in the Bible is called I mean it's right up there with murder it's a big 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 deal all right number two how can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up learn to focus on victory one day at a time one day at a time sweet Jesus that's all I'm asking for me give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Anyway, it's a great old song, one day at a time, one day at a time. AA understands that. People that have had victory in their sobriety, walk of sobriety, have understood, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not making a promise for next week. I'm not telling you I'm never going to take a drink the rest of my life. The man who's walking in sobriety who struggled with addiction, he'll tell you, I'm not making a promise. I don't know. But I know today I'm asking for God's strength to be able to walk in sobriety today. And tomorrow, I'm going to ask for God's strength to walk in sobriety tomorrow. 
You understand how helpful that is? One day at a time, one day at a time. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. In other words, I've got to depend on him today. I can't just, he's not going to give me a truckload of it and then say, don't think about me anymore. He's going to say, ask every day and I'll give it to you. Jesus also taught us Matthew 6, 34, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Deal with today. Deal with today. Rome wasn't built in a day. Character is not built in a day. Character defects aren't removed in a day. It's a process, but it's one day at a time. And don't set a deadline. How many of us have said, boy, I'm going to be in the best shape of my life by such and such a day? Don't do that. It's a process. You don't know how long it's going to take. It's a process. You just want to be moving in the right direction, every day getting stronger, depending on God for today. Depending on God for today. Number three, how can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up? Focus on God's power, not willpower. Focus on God's power, not willpower. We saw willpower. You'll never forget, willpower is turning the boat. Okay, will, that's willpower. Now, some people seem to have more of that than others. And I applaud them. I salute them. There are some people that just have it. I mean, they just, some people, and they, they can be self-righteous about it, quite frankly. Some people just, they just are, I mean, they've never eaten anything wrong. They just eat healthy, and they're just wired that way. But for things that really are core issues for us, willpower is not enough. It's not enough. Resolutions are simply forcing the boat to go one way when everything else in the boat wants to go the other way, and pretty soon you get tired. The Bible is interesting. The Bible says, Jeremiah says this, can a leopard change his spots? The answer is obvious. A leopard can't change his spots. But Paul would say in Philippians chapter 4, 13, I can master anything with the help of Christ who gives me strength. So that's what we have to remember. We have to remember, I'm going to focus on God's power because God says I can do anything. I can master anything through him who gives me strength. So you pray, Lord, I know I can't change with my own power, but I'm trusting you can take away the struggle. You can give me victory over this struggle. Remember Calvin? Let's say he really wanted help with his temper. He could say, Lord, I, say, Lord I'm giving you this issue today. Today. And every step of the way today, I want to be able to depend upon you to give me peace in my heart. I don't want to keep doing the dumb things I've done. I need the power that raised Jesus from the grave to become real in me. And I want you to just give me that split second between when I normally would act or do, and I just want to stop, and I want to say, God, I need your power, and I want you to be the one that's making these strong decisions for me. I want you to be the one that's helping me. I give you this issue. I need strength greater than my own. You said you'd put your power in me. You'd give this power to me. Your resurrection proved your power. So I want to let your power operate in me. Willpower doesn't work, but God's power can work. Number four, how can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up? I need to focus on what I want, not what I don't want. I need to focus on what I want, not what I don't want. Philippians 4.8, we use this about every week because it's one of those verses that can be used so many different ways. Fix your thoughts on what is true and good and right. Think about things that are pure. Think about all you can praise God for and be glad about it. Paul is saying focus on good things, not bad things. Focus on good things, not bad things. Whatever you focus on is what you're going to move towards. Whatever you focus on is what's going to dominate your life. If you focus on bad, it's going to dominate your life. If you focus on what you've been, it's going to keep dominating your life. If you focus on what you can be and what God wants you to be, then you're going to move in that direction. Whatever has your attention has you. If you say, I'm not going to think about sex, I am not going to think about sex, I'm not going to think about sex, I'm not going to think about sex, guess what? You're busted. You're thinking about sex all the time. That's what you do. So I don't want you to do that. I want you to think about what God, the future he has for you, not the past. I really worry about counseling that is always geared towards go back to your past. Tell me about your childhood. When were you potty trained? I mean, who cares about all that stuff? Maybe you have hurts in your past. Deal with those hurts. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the power of your future 
is a stronger power for change than understanding your past. Understanding your past, we're never going to fully get that. That's a lot of ups and downs and goods and bads. We're not going to get it. But we do have a chance if we move forward, moving towards something that's going to be very helpful. Now, here's an interesting thought, I think. Instead of resisting, instead of resisting, I want to suggest the Bible teaches us to refocus. You say, well, the Bible says resist temptation. No, it doesn't say resist temptation. It says resist the devil. Resist the devil, but if you spend your time trying to resist temptation, my observation is whatever you resist, persist. Whatever you resist, persist. The harder you push it, the harder it pushes back. So instead of resisting, the Bible teaches you refocus by turning the mental channel of your mind. If you're watching a show on TV and it's bad, don't keep thinking, I'm just going to resist this bad show. I'm just going to resist this bad show. I'm going to resist this bad show. Turn the channel to something good. Focus on what you can become, not where you've been. Give you an example. Okay, you know that Jane and I are trying to just live healthier, trying to do better. No ego about it. No, you know, we're, we're, we're just trying to do better trying to learn and grow and be a good example right but there are days when when you'll just think golly I want to I wish I could eat something a little bit different maybe go back and do something a little bit different eat on the old plan maybe (laughs) now I can sit around and I can think about the old plan all right the old plan where you ate whatever you wanted to eat and the more I sit and think about it I will be at Krispy Kreme. I tell you, in a couple of hours, I guarantee I'll be at Krispy Kreme. Or we can say, hey, you want to go to Piedmont Park and do a quick walk? When we refocus, you know what happens? After that quick walk, then we go to Krispy Kreme. No, we don't. We don't. We don't go (laughs) the old way. We'd go to Krispy Kreme. But now we don't go to Krispy Kreme. Why? Because we refocused our attentions. That's critical for you. Don't resist it. Focus on it. Be obsessed with it. Think about it all the time. Turn your attentions to something else. And what happens is you'll begin to have victory. Number five, how can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up? Focus on doing good, not feeling good. This is going to be key. Focus on doing good, not feeling good. Galatians 5, 16, so I say, live by the Spirit. Just do it. Live by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. If you do the right things, your feelings will eventually catch up with you. If you wait until you feel like changing, you will never change. The devil will make sure that you never feel like it. Now, here's something. This, this is one of those things that I, you may want to write this down. It's always easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. Now this is profound, it is. It is always easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. I used to say to the boys, action precedes attitude. I don't feel like doing it. Did I say anything about feeling like doing it? Action precedes attitude. Do it. It'll it'll catch up. It'll be all right. Action precedes attitude. Same thing we used to say, move a muscle, change a mood. Move a muscle, change a mood. It's okay. Just do it. Just do it. You, you, You walk through the parking lot and you see trash on the ground. Any follower of Jesus with the ability to see, you see trash on the ground. I would think that we know that God put us dominion over the earth and we want to pick up the trash, right? I don't feel like picking up the trash. Pick it up. Pick it up. Put it in the garbage can. You'll think, after you do it, you'll think, I feel good about that. You didn't feel good at the start, but you just picked it up. You picked it up. Important for us to understand this little principle. AA uses a phrase. In one context, the phrase is really, really wrong. The way AA uses it, I get it. AA uses this phrase, fake it until you make it. Now, I'm sure it does. I have never liked the idea that 
companies like Amway and, and companies like that, not knocking those companies, but they have used that and sometimes it's like act like you're super successful and buy the car that makes you look super successful and, and uh, do all of this stuff and fake it until you really are super successful. I'm not so sure I like that application of it, but I certainly like the idea that when I have issues in my life, I want to do those things that I know is right and the feeling will come. Anytime you start trying to change a major part of your life, a major character defect or flaw or personality weakness, anytime you start trying to make a major change, it's not going to feel good at the start. And what happens is we say, well, this doesn't feel good. So I'm gonna, I don't want to not feel good. So we go back and we do the very thing that's kept us in bondage our whole life. Let you in on this. Jane and I have not had sugar, processed sugar, in four months, three or four months, Okay. The first three days, do you think that was easy? You think that was something that we loved? Do you think I wasn't walking around saying, I'm so depressed, I'm so depressed, I just don't think I can do this. I think I'm going to go strangle a cat or something. I'm just, I'm so frustrated. I'm so, I just, I don't know what. I just feel like I'm going to die. I just feel horrible. But on the fourth day, we didn't miss it. Now we, this is no joke, we, I do weddings and we, you know, we're sitting at tables with people that are eating cake and they're eating cookies and they're wiping their face and, and we're just sitting judging them. I mean, it's just, uh, we're thinking we don't need to eat that. You know, it's just, we feel so good, but it's not even a temptation to us because we got through that feeling stage. You've got to do what's uncomfortable for it to finally catch up and the feelings to finally come. If you overeat or you drink or you smoke, the first time you try to break the habit, you're going to feel weird. A smoker is going to say, I, I, I need to put something in my mouth. I've just always put a cigarette in my mouth. This feels so wrong. This is not right. And after a, a few hours, you say, forget it. I can't do this. But if you will just do it and feel funny for a while, let the action precede the attitude. A action precedes you feeling good about it if you'll do that. Things will catch up. Your behavior will end up driving your, um, your attitudes. Number six, how can I gain victory over things that have long tripped me up? Focus on people who help me, not hinder me. Focus on people who help me, not hinder me. The right kind of people are going to help you. The wrong kind of people are going to hinder you. You know this. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. But the Bible also says two are better than one. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. And Proverbs 27.1 says, As iron sharpens iron, so people can improve each other. So you have to look around. You have to say, Are people that I'm hanging with, are they lifting me up? Are they pulling me down? Are they lifting me up or are they pulling me down? Number seven, focus on progress, not perfection. Focus on progress, not perfection. Some of you say, I don't think I can see the end of the tunnel. I've been following Jesus. I don't see how this is going to turn out. I don't see any dramatic change yet. It's a process. It's a decision followed by a process. Now, there are times when I felt like I was never going to get some victory in my life, but I just kept hanging on to Philippians 1, 6, and I want you to see it on the screen because it gave me hope. Philippians 1, 6 says this, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Paul is saying to me and to you, I believe what God started in you, he's going to finish in you. It's going to be okay. What he has placed in you that you're working out now, it's going to be completed. You're going to get there. And can I be honest and let you know, things that were kind of the trip me up when I was in my 20s, that seems like so far ago to me. Things that were struggles for me in my 30s, it's like, golly, I can't believe that was such a big deal. It's not a big deal now. Things that were pro problems for me 10 years ago, it's not, that's not a big deal. God is giving me victory. The list is still, I still have things that need to change. I still have things that I know God wants to work in my heart on. There's still things that I, I, I've got a ways to go. But when I was in the middle of it, I didn't think I'd ever change. But what I've discovered is he really was working in me. He really was. I used to have trouble with anger. I used to really have trouble with anger. I mean like crazy anger. 
Hot head, hot head. And now it's when people hear that, they say, no way. No way. It's true. But I don't know where that guy is anymore. Sometimes I think, well, I'm just going to generate it myself. And I think, I can't. It's just not there. I'm a pussycat. I don't mean to be that, but I am a pussycat now. I don't, I don't want to fight. I don't want to tell somebody off. I don't want to intimidate somebody. I'll say I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misrepresented or or, or stepped ahead of the line too much. My bad. My bad. God is really changing me. And he's really changing you. I know so many of you, your story, he's really changing you. And then others who are saying, I don't think it's working for me. It is. It is. Go back and review some of these thoughts today and realize it's a process. Realize sometimes it means taking some steps, some action steps before the attitudes begin to change. Action precedes attitude. Action often precedes attitude. Change the way you're thinking, um, and it's sometimes very hard to do, but if you change your actions, your thinking begins to change. If you don't want to be kind to your spouse, be kind to them anyway. I don't want to do it, but if you do it, You say, I don't have a feeling for it. Do it. The feeling will come. It'll come. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us to change us. The world should be able to look at us and see people that are constantly growing. When God said in the garden, you take dominion over this creation, he meant that we were supposed to love the creation the way he loved the creation. We're supposed to take care of things the way he would want us to take care of it and we're supposed to take dominion as well over ourselves he says that you are like viceroys Uh, we don't have authority because of us we have authority because of him we are second in command he gives us authority he makes you viceroy over yourself and he says take authority of that take authority of that when you take authority of that you remind the devil that he's not, he doesn't have the last word. You remind him that God is creating in you a, a new person. You're a new creation in Christ. Old things, gone. New things becoming a part every day. And learn to walk in that. Would you bow your heads, please? Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for allowing us to spend time talking about how sin does happen, but it's not the end word, how you really can help us. I pray each one of us would think about our hearts and lives and we would put into practice these things that need to be addressed. We would let you search our hearts to make us the men and women that you created us to be. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.